Wow. Okay, so thank you guys for coming. Um, I got here a little bit late, so I haven't had the chance to meet very many of you, so I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lampel, and I work for CG Cookie as a Blender instructor, and I'm also on the Blender Markets team. So in this presentation, we're going to be taking a look at the Blender Market specifically. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's the first online marketplace, or the only online marketplace that's exclusively for Blender products. So that's models, um, materials, textures, add-ons, anything that you can use with Blender, uh, you can sell through the market. So the, the market started in July of 2014, and it started out as, as a collaboration with uh, Jonathan Williamson from CG Cookie um, and Matthew Muldoon from BlendSwap who has since joined CG Cookie, and they've been working on the market for a little over two years now. So in this talk, I'm going to go over you know, why we started it in the first place, and where we are today, and what we think about going forward. So when we first launched the market, we definitely got a lot of good, positive feedback. Um, but of course, there was the obligatory uh, vocal minority that made sure that we knew that we were selling our souls for profit and uh, we're harming the Blender community by, by injecting commercialism into the Blender ecosystem. Uh, but of course, we saw things a little bit differently. We hoped that by creating a commercial side to the Blender community that everybody was able to participate in, we hoped to be able to increase the quality of both free and paid add-ons and assets. So the reason CG Cookie exists is to enable independent artists to succeed and also to be a positive force in the community. So we're hoping that the Blender market is an extension of those goals. So we wanted to build an ecosystem that rewarded creators for uh, creating products for quality over quantity. And we also wanted a place for artists that they could go to and get all of the tools and the um, assets that they needed to make quality artwork faster. So that was the dream. But we didn't really have any idea if it would take off or, or whether it would work. So selling models and textures uh, from a technical standpoint turned out to be relatively easy. The challenging thing came in when it came to selling add-ons with GPL. So if you're not quite familiar, any add-on that's in Blender also has to share the same license. So it has to be open source and GPL. And so if somebody hasn't developed for Blender before, they can be a little bit skeptical, of course, on you know why should I create something specifically for Blender, when by definition, other people can, you know, after they purchase it, share it out with other people who haven't purchased it, or also you know, build on top of it themselves and sell it as their own product, and, and kind of, you know, there's a potential for, for being ripped off that way. So it goes against a little bit of the uh, traditional business, business way of working. So before we tried to go out and convince other people to do it, we decided that we had to do it ourselves. So this came in the form of RetopoFlow that was created by Jonathan Williamson and Patrick Crawford and John Denning. And so the RetopoFlow is an add-on that makes retopology much, much easier. Um, but that did really well. Uh, so far, it's sold over $100,000 uh, since, it, since it came out. And that's particularly interesting, given the fact that you can find it on GitHub for free. And so the reason it's on GitHub is we wanted to make sure that we were in the spirit of open and, and sharing communication with our users. Um, you know, we wanted people to be able to learn from the code and be able to dig through it themselves and, and learn things from it. Um, and since this was one of the first large-scale paid add-ons, you know, it was at a pretty hefty price, we wanted to make sure that we introduced it in a way that was you know, open and still in the spirit of, of sharing. So of course, putting things on GitHub has had positive and, and negative results. So, First thing, it's been, it's been great for communication between us and our customers, and it's been great for better bug reports. And so development has been able to um, go along much faster because of that. Now, of course, the obvious downside is we don't know how much money we've actually lost from that. We have no way to you know, calculate how many people have downloaded it and not paid us for our work. So that's definitely a downside. But what's definitely clear is that it's not helpful to be too precious about your work. Um, there's nothing really good that comes out of putting too many walls between you and your customers. It, it stifles long-term growth. So one thing that we, we talk about a lot at CG Cookie on our retreats and stuff is how much is too much to give away for free? Because we have to find that balance. Because of course, if we're not making money, 
then we're not around to give things out to other people for free. So it's kind of a cycle, and we're always trying to find exactly where that balance point is. But of course, not everybody is in our position when it comes to uh, selling things with GPL. For example, uh, Algorithmic, the company that makes Substance, Substance Designer and Substance Painter, they have a really cool plugin for Maya, and they have a really cool plugin for Unity. And they kind of hit a roadblock when it came to Blender because of the GPL license. And in their case, the way that the plugin works for Unity is you can take your procedural material from Substance Designer and take that file, go right into Unity, and tweak all of the parameters inside the game engine directly. So this is really fantastic. If, if any of you have used it, you know how awesome it is. Um, but the reason it works the way it does is because it has some of the source code from Substance Designer. So in order to you know, make that with Blender, they'd have to open source you know, that part of Substance Designer, which is a really big deal and not, not something that they're willing to do. Um, but that's a really specific instance, and you know, it's likely not something that's going to happen to independent creators. Uh, an example of a company that has created a commercial product with Blender um, communicating very well is Pixar and their RenderMan render engine, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. So um, Brian Savory has done a great job of creating that add-on. And the way that it works and, and avoids any issues with GPL is actually if you download RenderMan for Maya and have Blender, the add-on just talks between the two apps and creates the UI for Blender. And so none of the source code from RenderMan is actually in there. Uh, the add-on is just for communicating between the two apps. So if you are definitely um, concerned about releasing your source code or anything like that, you can just create a separate app and have an add-on that communicates between the two. So another thing that's pretty clear right now is open source does not equal free. Uh, they're, they're not the same thing, because somebody is always paying for the work that happens. So in the case of Blender, a lot of people donate, um, and that's how they get money. But um, you know, if somebody's not paying for it, then it's being paid for by somebody's time. So it's always being paid for by somebody. And when it comes to selling add-ons, we're just kind of switching which end of the equation the money is coming in at. But there's always money or a significant amount of time involved. So on the market, of course, uh, you're not just paying for the code itself. Um, that's something that's really important to us. It's also about the experience. So we want to make sure that our products are, are quality, and so you have that peace of mind. Uh, when a creator puts an add-on on the market or you know, a model or anything like that, part of the terms and agreements that they sign is that they have to be available for communication with their customers. So if uh, you, know, you have an issue, you have that peace of mind of knowing that you can you know, immediately contact whoever made it, um, submit a bug report, and they'll get back to you. And if they can't, then you, know, you can talk to us. We'll either, you know, we're happy to give you a refund if, if anything goes wrong. Um, but you know, if, if we have an, issues, an issue with uh, developers you know, not getting back to you or anything like that, um, we had one instance where, where a creator just didn't have enough time to support his products, so we had to take those off the market. So that was definitely unfortunate. Um, no hard feelings. He just didn't have any time anymore for that. Um, but we wanted to make sure that all of our customers can get the access um, to the support they need as, as soon as possible. So it's also about that, that peace of mind. Things should just work. You shouldn't have to worry about it whatsoever. So that's what we started with. That was the, the dream and the vision. But let's take a look at where we are today in terms of hard numbers. So these are all 2016 year to date, so January through October, where we're at so far. First of all, we have about $333,000 uh, of revenue coming in. So that's up 31% from last year, which is definitely awesome. Uh, we also have 282,000 about um, in operation costs. So that is development. Um, a chunk of that is development for Blender Market 2.0, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but that's also just you know regular upkeep, um, paying for servers and the plugins that we use, and of course paying uh, Matthew and occasionally myself to go through products, make sure um, doing the quality assurance reviews, communicating with creators, uh, everything like that. So it's definitely not a, a cheap thing to run day to day. And so far, we've paid almost $200,000 to our creators just this year, so vendors that are on the market. In addition, uh, we've donated $19,000 to the Blender Development Fund. So that's something we're super proud of, because that's not our donation. Um, this is actually just out of 
the generosity of our vendors. So we have a, a separate donation for CG Cookie. This is not that. Um, when a creator creates a product, they have an option of donating a certain percentage. It's totally optional. They don't have to. Um, but they have the option of donating just a certain percentage of that directly to the Blender Development Fund. And by making it easy to do so, um, a lot of them are, are happy to do that. And so far, that's resulted in about 19,000 this year. So if you look at these numbers, you'll notice that, well, they don't quite add up. And that's because right now we're running at about $158,000 under. Um, so CG Cookie is, is eating that loss right now. And that's certainly a chunk of change. So uh, another couple, couple numbers, 31% um, uh, more in sales since last year. And our, our users, or in this case, just web sessions, the users were about the same graph, um, have stayed pretty consistent. But it's a valid question to ask, you know, if our, if our users are staying the same and we're operating at a net loss, you know, why are we still going? Um, why are we still continuing to do this? And not only that, why are we continuing to invest more in the project? So that's definitely a valid question. And the way that we see it is that the Blender market is kind of like CG Cookie's own little mini startup. Um, and so far, we're pretty happy with the results. So a lot of businesses don't start making positive money until you know, their third or fourth year. So it's nothing completely unexpected. Um, but also, just for having it be a little over two years old, it's close to generating you know, half a million dollars to put into the Blender ecosystem that wasn't there before. So people that are, are using Blender, um, people that are selling and, and creating things with it, that's half a million dollars that wasn't in that space at all before. And with you know, close to $20,000 being donated to the development fund, that also wasn't there before. That's definitely something we're happy to invest in. And also, um, I don't have a lot of testimonials. Matthew gets, gets most of those. But I've definitely seen more than a couple that have said that you know, since they've had a successful product on the Blender market, that they don't have to work as much overtime and can spend more time doing the things that they love. And so we know that we're on the right track, and we're happy to invest in the success of people. So I've talked a little bit about Blender Market 2.0. I've mentioned that a couple times. So what is that? Well, this is a complete recode of the market as it stands. So we were hoping to have this ready in time for the conference um, last week. But unfortunately, there were some server issues, and it'll be out coming this week. So we're definitely excited to have you take a look at that. Um, but the reason we decided to create a completely new version of it is because the old Blender market was created in WordPress. And that came with its, with its own slew of issues. So it started out OK. It worked. It worked OK. Um, but there were definitely some, some hardships. And one of those was we had to rely heavily on third-party plugins. So we couldn't create everything ourselves, and we had to you know, use other people's stuff. And so we didn't have as much control as we would like over the actual process of, of what happened. Um, and if you know, for some reason they broke something in one of their updates, we couldn't really fix it. We didn't have anything we could do about it. And so we just kind of had to eat those costs uh, as they came up. And so since we were relying on quite a few, that definitely had become an issue. Um, another thing is we couldn't. Uh, iterate very fast. We couldn't make uh, very many new features. Um, development was very, very slow. And it was time consuming to upkeep. So now we're creating everything completely from scratch using Ruby on Rails. And that's allowed us to make a very smooth web app that's a much better experience. And this solves a lot of the headaches behind the scenes for sure. Um, it'll make it much faster for, for Matthew and myself to go through products and review. Um, and we've added some new features that will definitely make experience for everybody quite a bit better. So we've made it easier for customers to purchase. So that's definitely important. We want that to be as streamlined as possible. But we've also made it a whole lot easier to submit your products. So before, that was pretty uh, a cumbersome form that was really ugly. And you had to fill it out all at once. There was no saving it as a draft. You had to type out everything all in one sitting and, and submit it that way. And it took a really long time to get reviewed. Um, so we've, we fixed that with a really smooth form. Um, quick process. You can submit it whenever you'd like. And you can leave us comments. And uh, we can email you straight from there. Um, another thing that we've added is reviews. So before you purchase a product, you can see what other people have thought about it. And you know, if you had a good experience or a bad experience, you can let the creator know uh, right in their reviews. And so that's definitely something that's been proven on, on multiple uh, websites to increase sales. So that's something we're looking forward to having. Uh, another interesting feature that's worth mentioning 
is the inbox. So I know we all have enough inboxes in our lives, but uh, this one's super cool because all of the communication that happens around the market is all in one single place. So if you have a question about a product, you can ask it right on the product page, but the creator gets that in their inbox. Um, the same place is if you have a support question, the creator also gets that in their inbox, and so they can handle everything all in one area. Um, and it allows really easy communication between either the customers and ourselves, or the customers and the creators, or the creators and us. So it definitely is, is more helpful in that. So that's what we've been up to recently. Uh, going forward, we have a few ideas. So these are things that we're just spitballing. We definitely know that we're going to continue forward with uh, Blender Market 2.0 and refine the experience as much as possible. That's the, <coughs> sorry, um, that's the, the big plan. But also in addition to that, we've been spitballing a few ideas that are not set in stone, but things that we might think would be interesting. So one of those is to incentivize creators to make things that we know will sell well. So one thing that's an issue with online marketplaces is people create a lot of really random things that you wouldn't really expect people would want to buy. Um, and that's totally fine. It kind of you know, fills it out. Um, and you get some, some really interesting products. Uh, but a lot of the time, there's things that we know will sell well, but creators just haven't made. So for example, modular asset packs for games, we know that's a huge thing, but there's only like one or two of them on the market. So an idea would maybe be to incentivize people to make those, either with uh, like a reward system or you know, giving a bounty for the first person who creates it or something like that. Uh, just create a fun system for getting the right products to attract customers. Uh, another idea, and I think this was from Tan, I'm not entirely sure I wasn't there for this conversation, but it sounds interesting, is use the fund, use the money that's going towards the Blender Development Fund and hire our own Blender developer. And so the way that that might work is instead of bothering the, uh, the Blender Foundation with all of our bug reports or issues that our creators have, we can just hire our own developer and have them work on issues. So if somebody's trying to you know, make the infamous uh, make render perfect button, but they have this issue with you know, some small thing in Blender that's just not working, instead of bothering the Blender Foundation, we can just hire our own person and take care of it for them. Um, and so we'd make sure that those those changes are in alignment with the Blender guidelines and make sure that it gets patched for everybody um, so it would benefit, benefit everybody. So those are a few ideas that we have. Um, there's definitely a lot of stuff going on. So that's just a quick overview of where the market's at so far. So that's, that's all I've got today. Um, but if you want to talk, we definitely want to be as open and transparent as possible. So if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free, feel free to flag me down in the hallway. Um, I'd be happy to talk. So, Thanks for listening, and have a good rest of the conference.